Hey guys, welcome back. Just kind of getting started here. But it's good to be back. We took a break for a couple weeks. Um, let me know if you guys can hear me alright. As always, when we start these uh, streams off, got to make sure that our volume's all at the right levels. Looks like we've got maybe one or two people watching right off the bat. So it's good to see you guys. Kind of just give everybody a second to see if anybody else drops in to watch tonight. Go ahead and uh, say hi in the chat. Let me know you're here. Um, yeah, we'll get started on this here in just a second. Looks like we've had a couple more drop in. Now I am going to apologize a little bit. If my voice starts dying on me a little bit, well that's because I've been at a convention all weekend and have been demoing Conquest with a whole bunch of people and my voice was shot by the end of that convention. So I'm going to be eating cough drops as we uh, do our stream tonight to try and keep my voice in a uh, Good condition. So tonight, we're going to be looking at the new giant kit for the city-states. Parabellum sent this to me as kind of a surprise. I mean, I kind of hoped they would send me one, so I was super happy when I saw a tracking number pop up last week. And, you know, I was hoping that it would be the giant and not something else. I mean, obviously I always accept models from Parabellum because they're all really cool. But the giant in particular, I've had a lot of people ask to see it on the channel. A lot of people have wanted to see us build it, review it. So that is what we're going to do today. So we'll start with the, uh, I guess the most... Uh, Obviously the most exciting part, right? The cards? No, they're, they're not the most exciting part, but they are pretty cool. So we've got two car cards that come in the kit. And I'm probably going to build the kit as the Hephaestion. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it or not, but that's how I'm going to say it. One thing I didn't realize looking at the box art, I didn't realize that he had a molten stone beard on his face. So I'm excited to get to paint with that. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. The Promethean is cool as well, but I think gameplay-wise I'll end up using the Hephaestion more. I like his uh, offensive spells, whereas the Promethean has more support spells. So these are the art cards, the activation cards for him. Pretty standard. And obviously we've got a base plate. Kind of look at the instructions. This has a pretty decent instruction set. So it starts off by telling you how to build the legs, because the legs are the part that remains universal across both variants of the kit. And it looks like it's going to be pretty straightforward and might even go together pretty fast. We'll see. We are going to build this here on the stream. And then it looks like after you've built the legs, you decide which variant you're going to build. They have a page and a half for the Promethean, and then just one page for the Hephaestion. It looks like either way it's the same number of steps. They just, on the Promethean, they just allowed the uh, pictures to be a little larger and more spread out, whereas the Hephaestion's rule, uh, assembly instructions are smaller. So that's those. And then we have the sprues, which are the part that everybody cares about, right? That's what we're here for is the model. So I was surprised when I opened up this kit, I didn't realize that these were going to be on like normal size sprues, like what the uh, like the infantry and the brutes come on. I thought we'd be seeing, you know, a sprue that's twice this size, you know, more like what we've seen on other monster kits, especially since this is the first dual monster kit. So they've done a good job at designing this sprue or these sprues 
to be very compact. They're not wasting any space with these. So we'll start over here. We've got the Promethean head. And probably my favorite piece in the whole kit is this two-part spear. The box art doesn't really give you an idea of just how long this thing is. But this thing's going half the length of the sprue, and that's only the halfway point. Like, it's still got the handle as well. So I'm really excited to get a chance to build that. I think it's going to look really cool. And honestly, it looks like that sprue, or not a sprue, that spear, trident, I guess would be the correct term, it looks like it's going to be pretty sturdy. Like, I know there were people that when they originally revealed this model, a lot of people were saying, oh, it's going to be a very breakable spear, but that thing's pretty thick. Guess we'll see once we get it built. Moving more towards the center of the sprue, we've got the two back options. Um, I believe the Hephaestion gets the one with the flame type stuff coming out of the spine, which that's my favorite of the two anyway. And then the Promethean has... I'm not sure quite what it's meant to be. It looks like a, like a column, like a pillar, on a, like a statue or a building. And that's just kind of the way they've designed it, even up at the top. It kind of looks like the top of a pillar. But I kind of get the impression it's meant to be more of like a cable of wires, likely enhancing or augmenting the signaling of the spine on the model. The body is in a lot of pieces. Like, this is part of the front of the torso, this is part of the front of the torso. Then we got two pieces for the back, and they're different sizes, so I'm assuming that means there's another piece somewhere that goes with this one to build out the rest of the back. I really love the uh, the stone arm on this model. The mechanical arm's cool too, but the stone one, I just really love. We also have the Promethean's hammer, which looking at the box art, I didn't realize that it was uh, as detailed as it is. It's got, uh, you know, dents and nicks in it, and then it's also got symbols etched onto the the face of the hammer. I'll check this out. Right here we've got one of the mechanical hands. And I don't know how well you guys can see it, but that thing's got some pretty cool detailing with the wires and the gears. Yeah, I'm excited for that. Obviously I'm not building that one, but I'll have to get another one eventually and build the mechanical arm as well. Looking at our second sprue. This sprue has the lower body. It looks like everything here goes to the lower body. Yeah. Well, I guess not everything. This is a the chest plate. I like how it's got all the cuts in it. When I saw the box art for the model, I thought maybe those were just painted on. But seeing that they're actually sculpted in, that's going to actually make it easier to make those cuts look like they're there. I like the uh, scale mail that he's going to be wearing around his waist. I think that's going to look really cool. And if we look at the legs, I do think it's interesting. I guess they didn't need to sculpt up under his skirt, but I do find it interesting that it's just like, you know, well, there's, there's his butt. <laughs> we'll see how uh, that looks when we get around to building it. I'm excited for this. Hey, Zarjeefly, good to see that you've made it. Hopefully you enjoy uh, watching us build this model tonight. So looking at the back of these sprues, there's not really anything fancy to look at. Nothing going on, really. Since this is only a kit for building one model, there's no need to put any sort of letters or numbering on the inside of the sprue or the inside of the pieces. So there we have it. That are those are his two his two sprues. And like I said, I was surprised to see that this guy's only on two normal size sprues. I was expecting more. But it's a good surprise cuz I'm assuming that means he'll come in a smaller box, be easier to fit on shelves. 
I would assume they'd package him like that. So I didn't get the actual box. They just sent me the sprues wrapped in bubble wrap. That's usually how they send uh, preview models. It saves them a little bit of money to not have to use up another box. Okay. Let's dive into building this guy. We've only been here for 10 minutes or so now. The review part's always shorter because nobody really wants to sit here and listen to me ramble about how cool the pieces are for more than a few minutes. So the instructions have a start with the legs. And I think what we'll do is we'll build this and then we'll see if we can, if we have time to base it, we'll do that as well. And we'll continue our basing scheme that we started with our uh, our minotaurs with the kind of trashing the camp theme. Um, I'm running a little bit low on super glue so we might have to go a little bit sparing with what we do on his base plate at least tonight. Okay. So it has a start with the legs so we'll get over to this other sprue. It wants us to start with piece number 30 which is this half of the leg. Now when you clip these, the coming straight on from the top, you're going to end up not clipping the whole sprue off. I recommend flipping it over to the back side. That way you can see where the tabs that connect it onto the sprue actually make contact and you can get the flattest possible cut there. So I'm assuming where I haven't streamed for uh, about two weeks now, we probably won't have as many people show up to watch this one, but that's okay. I'm going to be doing a edited review as well for this kit, and we'll do some size comparison in that video, and that'll probably come out tomorrow. If I have time to make the video from start to finish tomorrow, that is. I should. But you never know, life can always throw a curveball to mess everything up. Okay, this is piece 31. And those are some, uh, those are legs. Yeah, that's gonna be. I'm excited. This is gonna be big. I actually, the only giant I own currently is the Mountain Yotnar since Nords are not my main army. There hasn't been a whole lot of reason for me to spend the money to get the Artisan series Yotnar. Eventually I'm sure I'll end up with one of each, but just hasn't been a huge priority. So I'm excited to get to try to do a giant in this style. I think this uh, art style is quite a bit cooler than the the Mountain Yotnar, which was kind of the original style they were going to go for with the Giants. I do think that it would be cool if when they do their Mountain Yotnar, if they do make him a little bit more muscular because he's more kind of like the working class Giant, I guess you could say. He's not as noble and slim as the other two variants be kind of cool if they did a kind of like a midpoint between the skinny giants and the uh, the bulky one so our chat's a little bit quiet tonight if you guys uh, have any questions about this model please feel free to ask it's easy to answer questions when I have the model here and we can actually like stop and look at the answer to your question And if you don't know any questions, well, let's uh, let's just talk. See what you guys have going on in your lives. Maybe you got some cool projects you're working on, or maybe I don't know. Maybe you just want to talk. So right now, I'm kind of just cutting out all the pieces for the first step, and I'm going to clean them up, and then we are going to uh, glue it together. 
So it looks like the first two steps just have us cut out both of his legs. Now, I'll confess I was a little bit sloppy with some of these cuts, so we've got quite a bit of sprue. And there's a little bit of the mold line along here on this leg. So all I have to do to clean that up once we get this sprue chunk out of the way. Basically just going to drag the knife along and catch any excess plastic. And honestly, I think once we paint it, we're not going to be able to see those lines anyway. So I'm not terribly worried about it. Zar Jeefly, you're painting some Automata, that's pretty exciting. Uh, I've actually been thinking, I had a couple people recently ask me if I would do some tutorials on some Dwegom stuff. So I'm thinking I might have to pick up a kit or two, maybe just enough to build a first blood force. I just don't know what I'd put in it. Maybe some Thanes or something. I mean, I guess I do have that uh, Hellbringer Drake, and it probably could do with having a couple friends to fight with it so it doesn't just sit on the shelf all the time. Are you sticking with the color scheme that you had showed me in the past with the uh, kind of red-tinted silver? Or have you come up with something else? Yeah, I agree. Flame Berserkers would probably be a pretty solid pick. I know watching some of the demos we ran on Saturday and uh, Friday, Friday and Saturday, they were definitely among the units that were doing better in the first Blood games. Although it was fun to watch the. Uh, wall of initiates once people understood kind of how the initiates worked it was fun to watch them like garrison a, a tight corridor on the board interesting I was looking at this piece as I'm kind of dry fitting it, make sure I've got all the important parts cleaned up. I just kind of find it interesting. I'm assuming around here towards the back of the, the leg it starts to have that gap. I'm assuming that his like skirt pieces will go around that and cover that up. Okay, so you're moving away from the pink-looking automata. Are you just going to go pure silver with them then, like an iron color? Or maybe you're going to do something else? I don't know. And I definitely am hoping that here... When the uh, Steel Forge come out, I'm hoping Parabellum will send me some of those. That would be a good kind of springboard into doing some Dwegom tutorials. That, and I think that's a kit that I would probably buy if I were to make the dive into Dwegom.
And it's kind of surprised me that I've, I've heard a couple people actually say that they think they look kind of dorky, which I think they look awesome. Iron hand steel shaded with Agrax earth shade. I don't know if I have iron hand steel in my collection. I have uh, I have iron warriors, and that one's really really dark. I'm assuming the iron hands is probably closer to uh, more kind of the lead belcher kind of color, maybe a little lighter or a little darker. Don't know if I've seen that one, to be honest. Several boxes of the Steel Forge, huh? I think that's going to be a nightmare to fight against. <laughs> It'll probably be fun. They are going to probably end up, I think, my prediction here. People are going to get them. They're going to like how they play because they're going to be really, really tanky. And then they're going to get a points increase because too many people are spamming them. But I mean, I guess we'll see. Maybe they're not as good as I think they are. But I think that's something that we're going to start seeing show up in a lot of Dwagom lists because it's, it's a cool unit. It looks really cool. And I think it brings the highest defense in the game that you can achieve. These pieces are pretty nice. They're coming along pretty well. As I'm looking at this, it's going to be interesting to paint because the skin on these guys is pretty smooth, really. Um, like after painting, you know, orcs in 40k and all the old Dominion stuff I've painted, those all have, you know, rough, rotten skin. Lots of rivets and holes in it and stuff. I think I already cleaned this piece. Yeah, I did. Whereas these guys have some very smooth skin. The muscles are very smooth. They're not as rough. So a lot of the detail on the skin, I think, is going to come down to how I paint it. Like, if I don't put in extra effort to make the skin look, you know, wrinkly or more rough or detailed or dirty or whatever it might actually come out looking very smooth and almost kind of boring it's going to be an interesting little paint challenge but I guess we'll see because this is what I'm going to be working on for the rest of the week this will be my next tutorial I try to pump out and if I can do it right I might have it ready for Saturday or even Friday if not, it'll come out next week. We'll just have to see. Okay, so there are the pieces for the leg. Get our paper towel here. We're going to start gluing this guy together. It's going to take just a minute for the glue to start coming out of this. Well, maybe not. 
I've had it tipped upside down so that it wouldn't uh, take quite as long for it to be ready to glue. So it looks like the pieces are pretty straightforward, pretty smooth connection. I'm definitely going to want to like kind of squeeze the two pieces together once I have the glue on. Because this line here is pretty obvious. So if I can kind of melt those pieces together a little bit, that'll help make it look a little better. Nope. There's not really any sort of like guide rivets or anything that kind of help you line up the pieces exactly. The, the pieces do fit together pretty smoothly. But like you just saw, it's pretty easy if you're not gripping it just right. It's pretty easy to uh, accidentally separate the pieces. Okay. We'll see how this looks once we get the skirt part on, the the gird. Because right now, once you get up past the knee, that uh that mold line is the connecting point is pretty aggressive. Um kind of the same back here. I might end up doing just a smidgen of green stuffing. Just put some liquid green stuff in there to fill that in, but we'll see. It might be okay. It might get covered up by his his clothing. The leg connection is pretty straightforward. It's got a little nub inside the foot that helps it connect into the leg in the right spot. Now I just got to hold the piece together. This might be a connection that's worth doing with super glue, just because it's. There's nothing like holding the piece on for you. Like sometimes you'll have kits that'll have little rivets that help hold things together. There's nothing like that in this case. I'm also noticing that there's a pretty, pretty decent mold line right along the roof of his foot. That's an unfortunate place for it because it's something that'll be visible once the model's done. So definitely clean it up. I think we'll set that aside and work on the other leg. Always dry fit your pieces before you glue them together. There's nothing worse than destroying the details on a model because you didn't know exactly where the glue was supposed to go or how the pieces were supposed to connect. Once again, just like with the other leg, got to make sure you get this lined up right. There's not really any grooves to force it into the exact right location, so you're going to have to just kind of visually look at it and make sure that it looks like it's lined up correctly. And when you're working with plastic glue like I'm using, do your best to not get this on your fingers. And if you do, don't like leave your finger touching the model for too long because you'll leave fingerprints melted into the model. Most of the time it's not a problem, but you could ruin a, a good smooth texture if you uh, let it get carried away. Honestly, for how many people were uh, asking for the giant during our last stream, I'm kind of surprised we don't have more chatter going on about uh, 
this model. Well, so far I'm already pretty impressed with the size of this. Like, it's coming together very nicely, and I can tell it's going to be tall. Which, I mean, that's what you'd expect from a giant. I'm assuming this guy will end up the same height as the Artisan series Jotnars for the Nords. Okay, well... There's his legs. There's the first step completed. I'll just set that back there, put our cap on our glue, and get back to trimming pieces out of the spruce. So it looks like the next step actually only has us cutting out one piece, so I think we're going to combine steps two and three and do both the front of the skirt and the back of the skirt at the same time. So there's the back, or that's the front piece. Pretty cool. And then back piece so he's got scales scale mail in the front like lamellar style scale mail and in the box art they do that as metallic but you could also get away with I think doing it out of pieces of leather as well and painting it more brown if you wanted to I'm not gonna do that I'm gonna have mine be metallic and the back is uh, fabric and looking at the, the box art, I didn't realize that the back was different from the front. I thought he had the scale all the way around. But apparently not. Um, while we're at it, I think we'll also cut out the pieces for his tactical rock. And then from there, we'll dive into building the upper half. <laughs> Yes, I'm combining the steps. How dare I? A lot of times with Conquest models, once I've built one model, I don't ever look at the instructions again. Just because with, with monsters, obviously the instructions are useful, but with a lot of the infantry kits, all you need to know is how to put together each of the body poses and, and the arms and head you can put whatever you want on the models. I was a little disappointed with the kit for the hoplites. The heads are not universally usable. Like some of the heads, the plumes do not fit with certain poses. So I've actually, I'll have a couple models in my army where I've modified the heads, you know, maybe chopped off some of the plume a little bit just to make it so they fit. Because I don't like all of my guys looking identical. From a distance, they all look uniform, but once you get up close, I like it to be a bunch of unique soldiers in my armies. So far, I'm liking this the simplicity of this kit. Like, it's going together pretty easy. Pieces are pretty straightforward. I think the only thing I don't care for much with this being a dual kit, I don't like that that means if I have two of these in my army, like the two different variants, their poses are going to be still pretty much the same, even though they've got different upper body pieces, the leg poses are going to be very uh, similar. And that might be a minor thing for some people, but I, I tend to not like having duplicate poses on the big centerpiece things in my army. Unless it's, you know, literally the same 
unit in which case you know kind of were stuck that way but I don't think I'll end up owning more than two of these so I shouldn't ever need to do any converting to make the third like a third one or fourth one look better come to think of it I don't think I own the only monster in my collection that I own duplicates of is the Apex Predator. And those technically are my wife's models, not mine. Which, if we have time at the end of this, we will do a size comparison next to some of the other monsters. Unfortunately, I can't compare them to the other two artisan Yotnars because I don't own those. There's the two skirt pieces done. Now we just gotta get his tactical rock all cleaned up. be interesting to see how well this rock turns out when I paint it it's a fairly round rock it's not like as jagged as you'd see on like a, a Warhammer models tactical rock and so it might be a little bit of a different experience to just do the traditional gray base shade it and then dry brush it with a white it might not turn out quite the same way I guess we'll see. Not today, of course. We'll see when I paint it for my tutorial. And it's oddly got a lot of connection points to the sprue. So there's a lot of spots you have to clean up on these little rocks. I would assume that's just because the rock isn't the focus of the model, so it was a part they figured they could add stability to the sprues or something. I mean, I guess it is kind of a bulky piece as well, so more supports make sense. Okay, so now I will glue these on in the order that the steps have us glue them on. That way I'm only mostly a savage. Bring our paper towel back here. Okay, so for the glue on this one, it makes contact with the model pretty much everywhere there's an indent on this piece. And so I'm going to start by doing the border, but I am going to put a little bit uh, in the more open flat parts just to ensure that we've got good contact and good adhesion. Okay. Very cool. I like that. His little apron that he's got in the front, his chain or scale mail apron. Very cool. Now the back piece looks like it makes connections along the 
edges of the piece and then looks like just up here in these recesses up top so we'll that's where we'll put our glue That's pretty cool. I like that. I like how it's turning out. Definitely want to apply some pressure to these seams for this back piece because there's a little bit of a gap there that you can see. Well, I can see. Maybe you can't. No, it looks like it's pretty visible on the camera. And maybe that won't matter when we're done because there's three layers to his armor I guess so you have the the fabric part in the back and then here it goes into a texture that I'd probably say is more of a hide more of like a leather it's got all the wrinkles in it and little cracks and then it moves up to the the scales he's even got a pocket on this side it looks like which is kind of fun And I'm noticing that the uh, belt doesn't seem to go all the way around over on this side, so I'm assuming that when we put his torso on, there's going to be something on the torso that connects. Actually, and I bet it is, I bet it's this uh, little bit here that has like his tools and a little extra dagger looking piece on it. I bet that goes right there, but we'll see. Get his tactical rock glued together. This one doesn't look like it needs to be dry fit quite as much because it's got some pretty obvious like edges where the glue should go. Yeah, it's an interesting little rock formation. Got a lot of cracks in it. Now when I paint this, I'll have to decide if I just go gray with the rocks or if I do like molten rock stuff to look kind of like his arm. Because I mean, he's not necessarily causing the earth around him to be modified, I suppose. Okay, let's see. How is this supposed to line up? Um, so the rock in relation to his foot should end up like here and his foot goes helps if I can hold on to the model doesn't it looks like his foot is supposed to go about here somewhere and there are two little indents on the bottom of his foot and it looks like on the rock right here there are two corresponding bumps on the rock Yeah, sure enough, once I line those up, it kind of fits together. Cool. Um, I think what I'm going to do for this is I am going to put the glue in those recesses, but I'm also going to do some of the space around it. Just so that any point that it contacts the rock can get stuck together. We're not going to go up into this part of the foot, though, because that part... I believe is not going to be flat on the rock. Yeah, just like that. We are just going to have to hold this for just a minute. One thing I've uh, accidentally done here is as I've been trying to hold this, I've pushed one of the rock pieces up, and that's then in turn made it so it didn't line up properly. This might have been worth using super glue on this step. Okay, 
I'm gonna hold that for just a second like that. I agree. It is a very odd rock formation. It's a uh, yeah, it's just odd. It's like it's a bunch of rocks that are piled up. But they're not piled up in a way that, as I look at it, it doesn't make as much sense as you would think it should. I can only assume the rock was designed the way it is because that would leave people the option to paint it as molten rock if they were going to try and mimic the Hephaestion's arm. So here, here we are so far. Let's uh, just take a quick look here. There's your Minotaur. And there's a Hoplite. So I mean, he's gonna, he's towering above these guys. But that's about what we would expect from a giant, right? So I think with the way I paint this guy, he, so we've got the theme that he's like trashing the camp. That's kind of the theme of my base plates for my army. They're stomping on an enemy's encampment. I think what I'll end up doing is I'm going to have him, I might incorporate fire into his base somehow, like maybe I'll have him trudging through like a fire pit where they were cooking their food or something, or I don't know, maybe I'll keep it simple and just put a, a crashed tent under his feet. We'll see what I, uh, what I'm feeling like when we get to that point. Continuing on, get all the bits of sprue off my instructions here. Um, we're building the Hephaestion, so we'll turn to the back page. And from here on out, everything we do is the Hephaestion's instructions. I'm gonna push his legs back a little bit further there. Looks like the first little bit of building his torso looks like it's the same no matter which variant you build and that's just because he only has the one chest plate option so we need piece 40 and 41 so I think the way they've done this is the left side of his torso is the same regardless of which model you build and then the right side the right arms where most of the differentiated pieces are at. One thing I do like as I'm looking at this, and we'll see when we get further on, but this piece in here is a ball and socket. So if you wanted to be creative with the posing on your arms, I suspect all you're going to have to do is chop off the nub that goes in that hole, and you'll have you know, a full 360 range of motion with it. Now, does that mean it's going to look good that way? Eh, probably not. But it's an option. And it's always good to know that you have options. Okay, and we're going to also get piece 28. and piece 22. Yep, as I suspected, the spine that has the fi flames coming off of it goes to the Hephaestion. Which is good, because that's the one I like better. And piece 42. So I am kind of cutting out all the pieces for the first four steps of building the torso all at the same time and that's just because 
the way this is kind of divided up, that'll let it make it so that I can cut all the pieces for the torso out, get them all together. And then we'll cut out one arm, put that together, and then get the other arm. And then at that point, I think it's just his head and we're done. Now something uh, I noted earlier, and then I just didn't follow my own advice. When you cut the... Uh, sprue connection points off make sure that you find the angle where you actually end up cutting everything off because I didn't cut enough off here and so now I've got more stuff I have to trim off with the uh, exacto blade It's been kind of interesting as I look over at the uh, the YouTube page for this stream. I see people drop in and then drop out. So clearly I am not very exciting. Sometimes that's the way it goes, I suppose. Sometimes you just run out of things to talk about, and then you end up being boring. I mentioned at the beginning of the stream that I went to this uh, board game convention here in Idaho called Icon. It was quite a bit of fun. Uh, it was m me and then we had uh, three or four of my community members that came and volunteered to help out. We had a booth for presenting Conquest and it was it was a good it was a good booth. We did a good job of throwing it together. We had a table so when you'd first walk into the convention center, you'd look to your left and you'd see our painted models. And then from there, you'd get directed to the last argument demo table. And from there, you would then be directed to two tables that we had where we were demoing full, or not really demoing, but we were doing full playthroughs of First Blood and we were letting people pick the armies. We had all seven armies there. It was a lot of fun. Max, it's good to uh, see you in here. I see that you're painting some soul blight. That's pretty fun. It's been a while since I've painted something for Age of Sigmar. I need to... I've got a model sitting right here on my desk that I need to do a tutorial on for that. For my Oryx. Just don't have a whole lot of people playing it in my area, and so it tends to... Even though I really love the models and love the game, I just tend to not get chances to play it very often. Whereas Conquest, I think I get to play every week. When I started promoting Conquest, a lot of people just kind of gravitated that way. And I think part of it is just that a lot of my play group also plays Warhammer. So I think they liked the idea of having a fantasy game that is a whole different play style because Age of Sigmar and 40k tend to be very similar in a lot of their mechanics. You know, sometimes it just comes down to the interests of the player group. I think the reason that Conquest is... Another reason that Conquest has done well and Age of Sigmar just hasn't picked up in my area, um, I think has to do with the, the old players, the guys that have been around since the 90s playing Warhammer, or even older than that. 
a lot of them liked Warhammer Fantasy. And so when there was the release of Age of Sigmar, they got a little grouchy. And so now that there's a rank and file game in town again, you know, that is more appealing to those people. But that's just my area. I, I know there's plenty of places that Age of Sigmar has done really well. Now, if you wanted more people to play Conquest with you, you could always uh, try to get involved with the Vanguard program if you're not already. The Vanguard program is a great tool. It's a great way to get a community really going. At our little convention we went to this last weekend, I used probably four or five months worth of my kind of Vanguard prize support, and we gave it all away at this convention. I think five different people walked away with new models, which hopefully means lots of new players. Okay, the pieces for the main torso are cleaned up. We're really flying through this model. We're about an hour into our stream, and we've already got quite a bit of them assembled. Kind of curious to see if we... Uh, finish this all up and end up ending early tonight or if we can manage to use up all the time we have available because like really once we get him assembled we'll start doing the base plate but if we get the base plate done and we still have extra time I might end early just because uh, I don't have any other conquest models sitting ready to work on tonight that are worth putting on the stream but we'll see. You know, don't want to say what to expect one way or the other until we know we're actually going to get through this. These giants are a lot of fun. So did you just barely get into uh, Conquest then? Was city-states like your kind of thing that convinced you to get into the game or were you already collecting before hmm. honestly the, this piece on the torso is kind of a weird step it does have some things that help it line up properly but I don't know the placement of this piece is weird I this might be a little bit annoying to put together. Let's see. Let's see what we can do here. Well, Max, welcome to uh, welcome to Conquest. We're glad to have you here. I think Conquest is one of the games that's gonna it's gonna be around for the long run. I think. It's a really good game. It's got some fun gameplay. And it's growing pretty well. I can't say that it's, you know, going to be the top game out there anytime soon because there's a lot of other really great games out there. But it's certainly starting to contend for one of those, you know, more well known games. It's starting to get some recognition out there. And I feel like each army they introduce just gets cooler and cooler. And it's interesting because they get cooler, but they do so in a way that doesn't like invalidate the previous armies. So you don't buy the new, the cool new army and then suddenly think that the rest of the armies aren't cool. It's just like they somehow manage to get cooler without making the old stuff look bad. 
Okay, now we just got one more piece for this torso. And that's the back. And as long as we've lined up the other pieces, this should just kind of slide into place. I'm going to be honest, the torso assembly on this is a little bit annoying. There's just a lot of pieces that go into making this torso. So I guess that's one bit of feedback I would give to Parabellum. If you're going to do multi-piece bodies like this in the future, like to this extent, definitely put some sort of little nubs to help us line up the pieces right. Because I wouldn't be surprised if when these start getting out to everyone, we see people that glue them together in a hurry and end up not getting the the lines between the pieces all filled in and we end up with a lot of really aggressive gaps. That and this style of piece without guidelines working with plastic glue could be quite annoying. Because you gotta hold all the pieces together simultaneously while that glue cures. And it's there's a pretty long cure time before you can just push the pieces, or, you know, before the pieces are fully cured and stuck together, and so if you bump it, like the problem I'm having right now, like, I get this line lined up, and then the one over here will have shifted. Okay, it looks like it's kind of starting to take shape. This is also going to get covered up here, so we're not super worried about it. I believe this one also will get covered up when the shoulder gets put on. We have the leather strap, which just kind of slots in right there. Get some glue on that. Matt, good to see you in here. Representing your Hundred Kingdoms Griffin movement, I see. You know, honestly... If Hundred Kingdoms were going to get a monster, a griffin, I, I'd like to see that. I think there's good reasons to not do that, but I think that's a monster that would make sense for them. Another monster idea that I think would fit with the Hundred Kingdoms really well is some sort of elemental like they have wizards it wouldn't be very hard to say okay this wizard has a fire elemental and just have a big flame monster for their army or you know a rock elemental it could even be just a giant clay golem but we'll see I, I understand the desire on Parabellum's end to not make a, a big monster for the hundred kingdoms because that is kind of their thing is that they don't have a proper monster. One thing I'm, I'm interested to see how it plays out when the Ash and Dawn models release in a month or two. I'm curious to see how they fit into the existing Hundred Kingdoms playstyles. Because they're cl the Parabellum is designing the Ash and Dawn, or they have designed them, with the intent that they fill the monster slot for the army. So just like their impact on the battlefield is supposed to be very comparable to a monster. And their pricing for the kit reflects that pretty well, I think. Huh, interesting. I'm trying to figure out if I've done something wrong here because this body does not look like it's going to line up quite the way I want it to unless it's supposed to snap in. Okay, so it does snap in. So something to note when you go to building or when you get around to building your model, there are some guide bumps in the uh, in the model's waist and you'll want to look carefully at kind of the way the 
different indents in the waist are because this model actually does the body does kind of click in so definitely dry fit figure out how it clicks in before you um, before you put the glue on it because when I first set this on the initial place I set it is it was not where it was supposed to go so I ended up looking a little dorky Wow, this guy's big I kind of want to have to adjust my camera angle up a little bit so you guys can see the whole body I kind of want to go ask one of my community members to bring over their ice Jotnar to see how they compare because I at first glance I almost want to say these guys are going to end up being taller than the other Jotnars which would make sense because they're not they're not quite Jotnars I believe lore wise they're a little bit different or at least they have a little bit different origin and background I've often heard them referred to in the discord as titans rather than uh, giants And I always just kind of assumed that maybe that was just a purely thematic thing that people were saying to make them fit with Greek mythology better. But now that I'm seeing this, I'm kind of wondering if they actually are just ever so slightly taller than a Jotnar. Like, from feet to the head, from the bottoms of their feet to the top of their head. But I don't have a good way to uh, compare without having the model here. But I mean, these guys are pretty good sized. Look at that. Wow. This is cool. I'm excited to get to paint this. And uh, it's going to be a lot of work. There's a lot to do on these models. Wow. Okay. Let's set that aside. Brush off some of these uh, sprue chunks here. Okay, um, now we're starting on the arm, the spear arm. This is exciting because this spear looks like it's going to be massive. Grab the uh, sprue here. So I showed this at the beginning of the video, but for those that weren't here, this sprue, or not this sprue, this, this trident, it is long. Like, it's taking up half the length of the sprue, and that's only half of its length, because it's got the other half as well. This is going to be cool. I'm excited. Let's get this built. So we're looking for pieces 23 and 24. That'll make up his arm. Looks like 24 is here. I don't know why I keep calling his trident a spear, like it's, I, I clearly, I know the difference between the two. For some reason calling it a spear just seems easier. Maybe I'll have to get another one and clip the top off and turn it into a spearhead just so that I can be accurate and call it a spear. <laughs> Oh man, I'm, I'm really excited to see this on the table. This is going to be cool. And I did, I did find a way to fit it into my Minotaur and Hoplite list. At first when I started building lists for the city-states, I was having a hard time finding a way to fit it in in a way that I liked. But I've got one list. And once the uh, Thorkites and Agima kit comes out next month, I'll be able to actually build it. So, I'm not going to break this, but, so you see kind of the flexibility 
it's going to be a pretty stable piece. I wouldn't be too worried about this breaking unless you totally drop the model or step on it or your dog gets a hold of it, in which case it's not going to survive. But, like, from just bumping this, picking it up, playing on the standard tabletop, this is not going to break. It's pretty good. Because I know that was something a lot of people were worried about when they saw the model announced. I also know a lot of people are asking about how easy this would be to magnetize. So... The arm here is going to be easy to magnetize because it's just that socket joint, so you just put the magnet right in there. This arm, where it actually combines into the muscle, might be a little more work, especially since you'd have to ch switch out the back piece as well. So I would say you'd probably better off just getting multiple copies of the set than, than magnetizing it. Magnetizing it's a lot of work and it's not guaranteed to turn out as nice. So I think once we've got them all built, we'll do the size comparison at that point before we do the base plate. I've got an Apex Predator we can compare them to, I've got a Fallen Divinity, and I've got a Mountain Jotnar. I also have an Abomination floating around I can grab pretty easily, I think. I am a little sad that I don't have any of the Artisan Series Jotnars to compare with, though. Because I don't know if it's actually bigger than them, or if it's just me having no perception of the size of it. Artisan Jotnar. Oh man, that thing is so long. Wow. Just holding it together, you know, just kind of manually right now, but like... That's a big trident. So, Matt, you asked if I have a color theme for this guy yet. I do have something in mind. And I'll kind of explain what I have in mind here in just a second. Okay, so this thing is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about eight and a quarter inches long for this spear or this trident. That's massive. I'm excited. Okay, so color scheme for this guy. So the Hephaestion, which is the variant that I'm building here, he has like flaming hair and he's also got this molten rock arm. So I think I'm going to lean into that in his color scheme. I'm actually going to start the skin with an orange base coat and then I'll build it up with the normal skin tones and stuff. But the result will be that it has this orange undertone to everything, which will kind of, I think, complement the molten rock on the arm. He's going to be fairly similar to the box art, but not like an, I'm not attempting to mimic it. Um, I feel like with how skilled the conquest painter is for their box art, I if I tried to mimic that exactly, I would just be compared to that. 
and I don't stand a chance against that kind of painting. Like that's a whole other level. So I'm not going to try and make it look exactly like it, but uh, it's going to be pretty similar. I think you'll see things like the chest plate will still be in just kind of an iron color, similar to the box art. We'll have brass for the kind of the connection point for his his prosthetic arm. I'm thinking the scale will probably be, I don't know, it might look good in iron, it might look better in the bronze. I definitely need to incorporate bronze armor into it somewhere because the rest of my army has bronze as the main armor color. And I'm thinking I probably should try to design some sort, or paint some sort of stripes or something on the chest plate like he's almost got like a war paint going on or something. I don't know. We'll see. As for his clothing, like the skirt and stuff, so it's leather up here, so I'm probably just going to go a lighter tan leather. Um, I could also go a dark leather if I wanted, like a, a dark brown or a black could be cool. And then the clothing on the back, this kind of skirt part back here, is going to be the same color as the fabric parts on the Minotaur, so it's going to be this kind of green color. Kind of the way I've done my army color scheme, The anything that's not human in the army gets that kind of teal blue color. And I guess narratively, I don't know that it's so much that the army is forcing those, you know, non-human people into wearing a different color, or if it's just more something they did to help, I don't know, just something to help make the army look more coordinated or color appealing, I don't know. It's just a color choice that I've made, and then everybody else will be the blue clothing in the army. Then the molten rock is going to be a bit of a bit of fun to paint because if we look at like if we look at the card for this guy, even his beard is molten rock. And we'll see that when we get to working on his face. But we're going to have this, you know, orange and red and yellow hair going on up here. And then there's just black obsidian style rock. And I've ever, never actually done like lava effects, so it's going to be fun. Zarjeefly, that would probably actually look really cool. Gray or black skin, almost like the uh, salamanders in Warhammer. I could see that working. I do think doing a full dark skinned like Jotnar would be cool. A uh, well, a giant. And I think they do kind of go that way in the artwork a little bit. Because, like, you look at this guy's skin. He's not, like, full dark skin. But he's, like, that middle ground. Kind of like a Latino color, almost. Mine's obviously going to be a little bit brighter than that. Because this army as a whole is bright. My city-states are going to be... Very eye-catching army, I think. Okay, I think we're ready to glue this arm together. I just want to, like, double-check, because one thing I will say for, like, the spear, once you've got it glued together and put on the model, it's probably going to be kind of annoying to try and clean it up again after that, because just the angle, the design of the piece, you're not going to really have a good spot to grab it, so make sure you've completely cleaned up your piece before you glue anything together. Okay, let's get our glue out again. I guess I should 
bring our camera back down a little bit so you can see me actually applying glue to the pieces. We're not going to put glue here just yet because I believe that'll be where his hand connects in. And we don't want the glue partially cured before we're ready to put the piece on. Okay. Um, so I am going to use plastic glue here. I briefly debated using super glue. I think in the end the reason I'm going to go with the plastic glue is so that this is melted together. Because I feel like if I go super glue, all it takes is one day where the weather is too warm or too cold. And this spear is going to be falling apart. And by that I don't mean that I store my models outside or anything. Just more like... When you're having to drive somewhere and your car is too cold, you don't want your super glue on your models giving out and having your models break on the way there. Oh man, that spear. That spear is beautiful. And now that it's actually sticking together and I don't have to hold it in place. Oh boy. I'm excited. I mean, look at that. That's going to be... Oh, well, let me raise our camera a little bit. That thing's going to be up here like... Yeah, we'll see shortly. We'll see. One thing that I'm curious to see if it happens as Conquest goes forward, I noticed that there's a, it seems to be an increased focus on their monster models, and it's partly because monster models are just so impressive, they fill the table with, you know, very eye-catching models. With the Tontor, we know that it's going, well, I don't know if they've publicly stated how large it'll be. But I know it's been stated a few times in different spots on Discord, um, both for Vanguards and publicly, I think, that the Tontor is actually going to be on two monster bases. It's going to be super long and it's going to be super tall. And so I kind of wonder if we might start seeing more in the future, more like super big giants and, you know, big creatures. Holy cow, that thing is so tall. Yeah, you're, I'm not going to be able to store this in any of my existing containers for models. This is tall. Wow. Got a new tallest model here. This definitely beats out the Fallen Divinity for the tallest model title. But of course it's going to lose to the Tontor because I have no doubt that the Tontor is going to be taller than this guy. I'm putting quite a bit of glue on this part so that it melts really well because this is probably one of the most important connection points on the model because it's got the weight of that trident all on this one connection point. <coughs> but continuing on, I wonder if we might start seeing more big creatures. Um, I've heard the Hell, the other army that was up for voting this last January, they mentioned in there that there was going to be a primal drake, like a dragon. And I can only imagine that thing's going to be really, really big if they ever get around to making it. Okay, let me pull my camera back here a minute because it's not going to fit on camera. Okay, so there he is with that trident attached and let's like let's pull in the mountain Jotnar 
because that's the closest model I have. So there's your mountain Jotnar next to him. That is big. Wow. <clears throat> See, and the box art clips the uh, image off about here, and so you don't even see that whole top of the sp the top of his pole arm there. This is cool. I'm excited. The more I build on this, the more excited I get. Okay, let's take the Yotnar away for a second. Now I gotta fix my camera angle again. Okay, so now, while that's sitting off in the background looking pretty, we are going to try to brush off some of this these clippings here. Um, looks like the next couple pieces it has us put in place are his little his tools on his belt as well as the other strap that goes over the other shoulder which is piece number 25 so this one right here yeah transporting this model to conventions in particular especially ones where you have to fly I suspect it's going to be a bit of a nightmare. It might be worth it with this model to get uh, one of those big sheets of like pluck foam and just put him in one of those for storage. But I do think that unless you really mess up the model, it's not going to... That's. He's not going to break super easily. It's still a pretty sturdy uh, sturdy piece that he's got for that trident. Too bad you guys can't see my facial expressions as I stare at this model. Because I'm only kind of like half paying attention to where I'm cutting with the knife. And then I'm like, keep glancing up at the model and thinking, wow, this is, this is cool. I'm excited. This is probably my favorite monster model I've purchased for Conquest so far. Like, I think this is going to be a lot more... I'm going to I'm going to use it a lot more than any of the other monsters I own. It's like I have the Fallen Divinity for my old Dominion, but I I rarely use her her playstyle and in relation to the other units I have in my collection for old Dominion, her playstyle is just not my favorite. But this guy, I think he'll make it into my list pretty often. Okay, let's get these two pieces glued on, and then we'll move on to his other arm and his head, I believe. Another Drake, like a Hellbringer Drake? Well, at that point, I'd have to actually start playing Dwegom, but I like having friends, you see. become kind of the joke in our group that if you play Dwegom it's because you don't like having friends. 
Not because we actually shun people that play Dwegom, just more because we like to tease our our Dwegom player because he's won all the tournaments recently that we've hosted. I'm going to put some glue kind of partially down the uh, tools on this guy because there's a couple spots where it looks like it contacts with the clothing and more points of adhesion is always better. This guy's definitely skinny relative to his uh, like his size. He's not like he's defined. He's got good muscles on his arms and his legs are pretty defined, but he is a slim muscle kind of build, which makes sense, I suppose. Being the size that this guy is, I can only imagine that having bulk muscle wouldn't be very advantageous for him in terms of finding food and staying alive. Oops, oops. Gotta be careful when I build models like this because these little uh, tools on his hip have this little spot right here that can very easily catch if you're not paying attention to where you grab the model and while the paint is still drying that could be not the paint while the glue is still curing that could be a problem okay looking awesome um, our next step let's put our glue lid back on Let's do the, we're going to do the head first, just because I want to uh, spend a little bit of time looking at his other arm to see if you could reasonably repose it if you wanted. <laughs> I see your quote there, Major Armstrong. <laughs> Getting in here to cut this this head out of the sprue, um, you'll definitely want to take time to play around with the angles for the clippers because you're going to have to do less cleanup and have less chance of ruining the details of the face if you get most of the piece clipped off before you get to the knife stage. So we need that piece. And it looks like his head is a two-piece head. So you got the front of the head and then the kind of back portion. When you're working with an X-Acto blade around details like the face and the head, you definitely want to make sure you don't cut off too much plastic because the head is one of the, particularly the face, is one of the first places people look when they pick up a model and look at it. It's just kind of the natural way people are. And so if you've uh, trimmed off too much and ruined his face, you just end up being sad. As I'm sitting here building this model, I keep noticing that I keep like totally hunching over to work on this model. And as a result, my lower back is not liking me right now. Got to force myself to sit up straight a little bit more and stop uh, hunching over my models like Smeagol. Hunching over the one ring. <laughs>
Oh, I agree with you. Being able to compare a C and Ice Jotnar with this model would be really nice. I wish I had a couple on hand. Um, I suppose if I delayed my review video by a couple days, I could ask my local Nords player to bring both of his Jotnars so that I can at least do a size comparison in my, my video. But that would delay it by a few days. So then the question becomes, am I going to have time later in the week to work on a video? This head's pretty fun. This f flaming hair is going to be quite a adventure to paint. And because it's on the face dash head of the model, it's going to be a detail that you definitely want to do a good job on. So I might actually have to go research some more detailed ways to do my fire. Cause normally I just keep fire pretty simple. Okay, we're just gonna put glue along the uh, seam line here. Yeah, it goes together real great, real easy. Oh, there's one little spot that I think I'm gonna add a little bit extra glue right here. This little arch, it looks like it actually connects with another spot on the fire, so we're gonna glue it together to help the head be more durable. Okay, gonna move our camera angle up again. So we're bringing the whole beast over here. So I'm just kind of playing around here. So technically, the way the neck is sculpted, you really only want to be putting the heads on the one way that they're designed. It should be like so for this guy more or less. I'm gonna have to wait till this head is cured a little bit more though just because it has kind of a per precise connection. Like you're not gonna be able to angle it this way and still have it look natural. Oh, there goes his head. You're right, they, well, did they do a, I think you might be right, they might have done a comparison for, for these giants. I'm just having a hard time picturing it in my mind. I know they did one for the, the new Ash and Dawn cavalry to show how big they are. Let's see, why is this not... There we go. Okay, something else with the head. The head does kind of wrap around the uh, the socket a little bit here. And so it's actually a good idea to use plastic glue for this and not super glue. Because if you glue those two head pieces together, it's not going to be able to kind of expand to fit around that, that ball and socket. At least based on what I just did now it kinda the pieces had to kinda separate a little bit to kinda engulf the neck piece but now that it's on like you can tell it's there's not really even gonna be a, a seam that's gonna be visible for the connection of that head look at that he's so angry imagine you're the little guy that's about to get that trident in the face and this is what you see <laughs> Okay, let's get that other arm going. So we want pieces Seventeen and eighteen, which seventeen is actually on the other sprue. Just kind of random, just to have one piece of his arm be on this sprue, and then everything else is on the other one. Guess we'll bring our camera angle back 
down again so we can see what we're working on. Okay, so that sprue is empty. We can toss that away now. Then we need piece 18. This is this guy right here. One thing I kind of wish Parabellum would do, so they've got that uh, the Tontor that's up for pre-sale right now, and a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people online say that they're not willing to jump into that pre-sale because they think that's too expensive for a Conquest model, which it is certainly, it's expensive, but I wish they would come out and do like a a render of that 3D model rendered on a computer next to some of the other recent monsters just so that people get an idea of just how big the Tontor is going to be because I think once people know how big it is complaining about its price is gonna go away huh interesting So I was just observing here, and I could be wrong here, but it looks like with the pieces that we have, this arm connection actually doesn't have anything that makes it have to go on at a specific angle. So you're going to be able to, I guess we don't really need this piece right now, you're going to be able to rotate this arm, I mean not any angle because there's going to be a point where it starts looking dorky, but you could reasonably have his arm more forward, more backward. I guess you could have it like raised up like he's trying to flip someone the bird or something. It's kind of a fun feature though because it means if you have multiple of the same giant you could uh, make them look a little different. Looks like we've got quite a few people in here watching right now compared to what we had at the beginning. So that's exciting. Maybe that's just because now we've actually got a giant standing in the background, so it's something to look at. Whereas before it was just a pile of pieces. This is going to be fun to paint, like, these rock details are, they're fun. Maybe I should be goofy and just paint it like the thing, the rock, the rock details are just going to be that kind of yellow tan rock that you see in Fantastic Four. That would look kind of dorky. Maybe, maybe it wouldn't, I don't know. I'm not going to do that. But it would be funny. So with how many connection points there are for the pieces in this kit to the sprue, you definitely will want to make sure you've got a good exacto blade on hand or whatever tool you like to use for trimming off sprue bits because uh, otherwise there's a lot of pieces that just won't go together right if you're not properly trimming them all up. The mold lines haven't been terrible 
There's a couple gaps that if you don't glue it together right, you might have trouble with. But I haven't had to clean up a whole lot of like mold lines on the individual pieces. Just a couple pieces that had issues. I'm very curious to see what other people do with the giants as they start painting them. I think there's a lot of potential to do a lot of crazy things. I predict that you'll probably see somebody that will paint the stone on this, this arm black and then green glowing between the pieces. Almost like the Necrons kind of look. Somebody will do that because it's... It would look cool. It's just a way that kind of makes sense to do it. It would kind of also kind of give it like a Warcraft vibe because they had those uh, in one of the expansions of Warcraft they had a bunch of like Gollum dudes that had that kind of aesthetic to them. Okay, let's glue this together. And we'll have the arm on. At that point, we'll be done gluing the model together, and we can take a look at its size compared to some other creatures. I think we will take a minute before we glue the uh, glue the arm on. We'll kind of goof around with some of the angles we could do. Okay, how is this piece supposed to sit? Arm like this. Okay, there we go. It's taken me a minute to figure out how this sat flat because I was trying to line up like these edges in the inside. So when you build your own, it's the back, the outside of the arm that has the edges that are supposed to line up. We've almost got this stuck on. This piece, if you're using plastic glue, will take just a minute to uh, kind of secure the bond because there's not a ton of contact. Like when you actually look at the piece, it's really just the back side of this part of the elbow that's making contact. This is all a gap on this side because uh, it's just the way the arm is designed. Okay, set our glue to the side for a minute, but we're not going to close it up because we are going to use it shortly. Bring our giant up here, raise our camera again. Okay, so it's kind of default pose is like that basically. But you could rotate it, have him kind of almost. So down here, usually when you throw spears, you use your hand kind of to. It's kind of like an aiming thing. So down here, he's basically targeting somebody below him. But if you were to start raising it, even though his spear angle, or not his spear, his trident, trident angle isn't quite lined up, you could say that he's bringing the trident up to throw it at somebody that's more at his eye level. So you could make it look like he's getting ready to duke it out with another monster. And theoretically, you could probably alter the neck a little bit to bring his head angle up as well. Um, you could have him waving. Uh, it looks a little dorky at that point because the, just the body pose doesn't quite line up. But you could also go further back. Maybe he's like signaling for somebody behind him to like hold back, don't, don't come up and advance just yet. So I do like that feature. And because it's a ball and socket, you could pretty easily add 
like a ball piece in here and then that would make it so that if you wanted to say have the arm coming more inward that hole right there could just be filled by a ball and it would look natural so this the arm is pretty easy to modify I think this arm is if you wanted to do something else with it and it definitely has like right here is the spot where it's meant to be because that's where it slides in the most smoothly It just kinda settles in that way this is cool I like this I like this a lot okay we're gonna glue this on now Definitely a, a good call on the design, though, from Parabellum's part to uh, make it so you can reposition the the arm a little bit. And I'm assuming that was intentional. Because they know that people are going to have... There's going to be people that have two or three of each giant. They'll buy six copies of the set, and that's... They'll want to modify them so they don't all look the same. Okay. So there's our model. He's pretty. Oh, that would be a cool modification to make. Make it look a little more like gladiator arena style, throwing a net or being like a fisherman. Um, wouldn't be too hard. You would just kind of maybe rotate the arm up a little bit more and put the ball and socket in there and then you could just have the net coming off of his hand or you could have it you could probably pretty easily like heat up these these fingers and bring them into a knuckle or like a clenched fist I mean or alternatively his hand for the robotic arm is a clenched fist and so if you use the robotic arm instead of the stone arm, you could probably pretty easily do more of like a grabbing the net and having it in like a ready pose rather than in the process of throwing it. Yeah, because that pose he's just got his arm down at the ready, so you could have the net hanging out just down below that and then still do the, the trident if you wanted. This is a cool kit. I like this one. This one's definitely getting a uh, positive review from me because this was fun to build. So let's uh, let's quickly take a look at some other monsters next to it, and then we'll start figuring out its base plate. It looks like we've got about an hour left, so we might get through the base plate. We might not. It depends on how crazy we get with it. So we had the uh, Mountain Jotnar before, but we'll bring him back again. So there he is next to the Mountain Jotnar. And I'm actually going to step away for just a second to grab the uh, Apex Predator and the Fallen Divinity. And I'm back. I had most of these set out so they were close by. So we should be able to pull them over pretty quickly. So we got the Mount Yotnar. Let's pull that away. Throw it off to the side. Bring in the Apex Predator. And it's going to be kind of hard to get both the Apex Predator and the uh, Giant on at the same time. So... This angle doesn't show it super well, but if we were looking from more straight on, like, you can tell the uh, top of the trident extends maybe a good inch above the height of the Apex Predator's spear. And the Apex Predator is also on a base where this guy's not. He'd be this much taller normally. So very cool 
him kind of stand on the opposite side of it. You can see his height there. His fist basically is about a head higher than the head of the uh, the rider on the Apex Predator. Have him ride on the T Rex. That would be really, really funny. He could probably fit too, and it would look like he's just riding on like a small pony. <laughs> Now the problem is I've got all these monsters on my desk and I don't have a good place to put them all. Okay, we've got the Abomination. I went and pulled one of those out real quick too. So yeah, he's actually, he's pretty close in size to the other Yonars, I think. I just don't have one here, and so my perception of their size is not accurate. And then I'll pull out the Fallen Divinity next, but I do have that one inside a box, so it's going to take me just a second longer to get it up. I'm ready to go. Okay. Since the Fallen Divinity is part of the Artisan series, it's a little more brittle. I actually store it in a box with a bunch of, like, plastic bags around it to keep it from breaking. And it looks like the paint's gotten chipped a little bit on it. So... Yeah, Fallen Divinity has lost her title of being the tallest monster. She used to be able to say that from the tip of the wing here, she was slightly taller than an Apex Predator and the Jotnars. This guy's spear, or trident, is definitely sticking up higher by quite a bit. Very cool. Give me just a second. We'll put away the monsters that I have here, and then we will get to work basing this creature, this monstrosity. Okay, let's figure out the base plate on this thing. Um, I guess I do have a Hellbringer Drake. Just have to remember where I put it. I'll grab the Hellbringer Drake real quick. And then I'll be right back again.
Okay, here we are with the uh, Hellbringer Drake. Granted, I've got to put them so that they're both the same distance away from the camera, or you're not going to get quite the uh, idea of the size. <laughs> I don't know if it's quite big enough to uh, use the drakes as uh, rollerblades. Yeah, this is cool. Okay, Hellbringer Drake, you can go back into hibernation. So our next step here is to uh, figure out how we're going to base this thing. And I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with it just yet. So we'll start by getting our base plate out of the bag, I suppose. Sorry, just a random observation I had. This is actually probably one of the lighter weight monsters in the game, like in terms of its actual weight for the model. Because even the Abomination is bulkier than this guy. So luckily this model is going to be pretty easy to position on his base. He doesn't have any like crazy parts extending over. So we're going to be able to basically just center him and then glue him down and start working around him like a lot of times with the monsters I'll have to like figure out where their feet are gonna be you know mark it and then I have to work with all the cork and the other stuff this one I honestly think we can glue him down and then start doing the basing around it cuz he's not really modeled in such a way that he's interacting with his environment around him other than the tactical rock <clears throat> so go ahead and use plastic glue to uh, secure him to his base that way he never comes off ever and luckily we got a pretty flat base plate so this is going to be nice and easy we're not going to have to boil it and warp it at all or anything like that His lightweight uh, build here is going to be really nice for painting because it means I'll be able to hold it by the base plate without having my wrists get super sore from holding up its weight. Which means I'll be able to paint him without touching him a ton. That's one thing that drove him in order to support its weight so that I didn't accidentally drop it or just destroy my wrists trying to hold it up. I usually had to brace you know, some part of the model had already been painted with my other hand, and that usually meant I was rubbing off small amounts of paint and having to repaint a lot. So hopefully I won't have to do that a whole lot with this guy, which is good. I like that. Put a lot of glue on this so that he doesn't go anywhere. And this will probably be the last time we need the plastic glue, so we'll go ahead and just cap it and set it off to the side. And we just do our best to kind of center him. Now, when I center him, we're not centering necessarily the whole model over the center point. We just try to center wherever his center of balance is over the center of the base plate. So, like, if he were in a running pose, 
he'd actually be standing further back so that his center of balance is over the center of the base. It's usually how you base models. We can kind of get a view from above and figure out if he's where we want him. Did the uh, stream disconnect there for a second? Because I just got a notification saying that it had reconnected. If it did, I apologize. Usually my internet is really good, so I'm surprised that it would have uh, dropped for a second there. Man, this is really cool. I'm excited to paint this thing. Just kind of have to sit and stare at it. Yeah, tipping that model over, it's going to be very easy to... to hold it by its base plate while we paint it. Got a little bit of a like a sprue connection to the base that I had to clean up there. Okay, so now we gotta decide what we're gonna do with our base plate. Um, I'll probably pull out some cork board and do what I like to do normally. And so let's grab a good chunk of cork here. So here's our cork board. And I have larger sheets of this, but I just pulled off a chunk because we don't need a huge piece of it cluttering up our what we can see on screen if we bring our camera angle down a little bit more so hmm if we look at how I've based the minotaurs a little bit so with my minotaurs I tried to make it so that the stuff that was on the the stand would line up with the stuff that was going on on the base. Which I've still got to finish this one. It needs to be dry brushed a little bit. And it needs to have grass added. But the idea was that he's storming through a campsite and these were like the piles of firewood that were getting kicked around. And then on one of our minotaurs, the one we did on stream, which I still haven't finished, I confess, we have plans to do, uh, these are supposed to be tent rods, and we're going to have some bits of, uh, they're just going to be bits of paper towel, but they're going to be painted up and hardened up so they look like a bit of canvas, like there was a tent here. So if we follow that same theme, I think what we might end up doing is maybe we'll have this guy either trudging through like a fire pit which if it was just a temporary camp it wouldn't really have much of a fire pit to be honest or we could have him stomping on a tent maybe we sculpt it so the tent looks like it's actually partially under his feet hmm yeah that could be kind of fun like he's actually stepping on the tent and then maybe the pile of rocks was just happened to be next to the tent. It's so tall. <laughs> I'm just geeking out. This is a fun model. I'm really excited about it. Now watch me spend the next hour just oogling the model and getting excited about it. Okay, we're going to put some rocks up in the front of the base, I think. I think we'll go something like... Something like that for our rock formation. We'll have it so that it's got its taller... Uh, let's, see, let's take a little bit off the back here. Because I don't want it going all the way up to his feet, because that's where the tent's going to be getting stomped on. So we'll put it up here towards the front... We'll have it get taller towards this part. And 
gym, a, a beach landing base sounds really cool. I'd be super interested to see how you execute that. Okay, so let's see. Continuing on this. What we're going to do is I'm basically just going to go through and where the curve between the two pieces is. I'm just going to lightly cut with my X-Acto blade. And then we'll just break the pieces apart. So this piece will go over here. And then this piece will start on the other base. And there is going to be a gap there. In the end they will be separate rocks, but they're kind of part of a rock cluster that's all close together. And we'll probably build up like that. So he's got like, maybe what was going on is the tent was backed against a rock cluster. And he's stomping it and now he, he's, or he's already stomped the tent and now he's stepping over the rocks to get at whoever's on the other side of the rocks. Maybe add some more rocks here. And at this step, it's kind of just random. We're just trying to see what could be. Something kind of sort of like that for the front half of the base. The only problem we're going to run into with this is because he already has a tactical rock, the texture between this rock and these rocks is going to be completely different because these are more of like a concrete gravel style rock. It's going to be very grainy, whereas this is a very smooth rock. So we'll see how that turns out. So I'm going to take this out for a minute. The issue we're going to run into is that my super glue is almost out. There's only a little bit at the bottom. So, we're going to get as much rock work as we can done, and then we're going to improvise after that, because once I run out of super glue, I'm not going to be able to put the cork down, because the cork doesn't, like, you can do it with, like, Elmer's glue and, you know, normal PVA glue, but it's not going to stick fast enough for us to finish it tonight if I run out of super glue. And I usually like to go through and make sure that there's not any bits that hang over into the tray area, like where the base should go, because we don't want there to be a ton of friction every time we decide to take this guy out of his tray. And I will, at some point in time, probably use him for first blood. So we're not gonna we're not gonna base him in such a way that he's stuck permanently on the square base. Okay. See, I didn't used to do super creative bases for my Conquest models. A lot of the stuff I did, like my old Dominion, I kept it very basic, just put texture stuff on them and then painted it, and I'm going to eventually add a little bit of grass, but now that you don't remove models from the trays as much, I am starting to get a little more creative with my bases. So like even the stands for my infantry, which you won't see a whole lot once they're all ranked up, even with them I added rocks and bits of debris here and there so that from a distance it's going to look like there's actually something going on under their feet and I haven't actually finished enough of my city-states to play with them yet now I'm just going to kind of go through and start chipping this and this is going to make kind of a mess there's going to be a lot of little clipped bits of corkboard on my desk here but if you just go and chip it like that it tends to make the top of it look like you know a broken rock cluster and 
when you kind of start layering the rocks, you think of it in terms of like each layer is not going to remain a full intact layer. They're going to get broken down to be shorter. Okay, that's probably good enough for this piece. Although, another thing I like to do, I like to make sure that none of the basing is hanging over the edge. I usually like to leave the edges of my trays and my base plates black. To me, it just kind of helps, I don't know, set the boundary for where the, kind of the artwork begins, I guess you could say. So I usually like to make sure that there's no overhang. I also find that this is a, good way to do it just because then when enemies are lining up with your tray you don't have to worry about them scraping off your your fancy base plate base plate work and then we're going to put this piece over here in this corner like so glue this piece on about there I think quite a few people watching right now I think this I'll have to look at the the numbers after the stream's over, but this might be one of my more well-watched live streams, which is cool. I, I like to see things grow, even if it's just a few people at a time. And it might just be that tonight's video subject is more interesting than some of my past streams, because I know a lot of people have been asking to see videos about the new Giants. I can't blame them, they're cool. Okay, on this one, I think we're going to actually leave the top flat and not break it all the way down. Just to add variety, because if all the rocks are broken down to the same height, that doesn't look as natural. Then here, I think we'll go take these pieces off. We're just trying to put just enough glue on there that this will stay stuck down. Corkboard is very porous and so it just absorbs glue like crazy so you don't want to you don't want to put too much glue on you want to put just enough to get it stuck down it's it's going to stay stuck the super glue does a pretty good job but if you put too much on it's just going to make your cork board turn rock solid um which sometimes that can be a good thing uh, if i'm making terrain with cork board i actually do like to put a layer or two of glue over everything whether that's super glue or like mod podge or Elmer's glue just to so it gets soaked into the cork board and hardens it so it doesn't chip as easily after we're done working with it. Okay, I'm gonna put this guy right here. I think we're starting to hit the point where I'm gonna start running out of glue. See if we can get these rocks that we had planned in place, and then from there it's mostly just texture paints, and then we'll uh, we'll figure out the tent canvas. And this piece is going to go right here.
something you'll find when I do my basing, and you probably find this in your own base plate experiences, it's not always 100% planned out. In fact, most of the time, the exact placement of stuff is improvised, at least for me. I don't go into it knowing exactly how it's going to turn out. I tend to just kind of start layering bits of cork on and other details, and I just kind of go with what feels right. Because generally, like, nature isn't so well planned out that it looks structured. I mean, it has its certain degree of natural, naturally occurring structure to it. But by doing it random, designing it random, it'll look more natural because that's how nature is. Nature is random. At least random to our eyes. Okay. Got those pieces of cork on, and we have a smidgen of glue left, so if we need a little bit more, we can summon a little bit more. Although we don't have very much. So I'm just going through, I'm doing the same as what I did before, I'm just chipping away the cork to give us a more stony texture. And if you've done this right and you've layered your pieces, you'll notice that between these two pieces there's almost not a visible line dividing the two pieces anymore, like they've pretty much merged into one piece. I wonder how long it's going to take me to paint this. So generally I find that projects like this take a long time, but if I can get like really excited for a project where I'm like, where it's at the front of my mind and that's all that can you know, I can focus on, when I can get zoned in on a project like that, I can actually finish something pretty quickly. Like, if I could get in that kind of mindset, I could potentially finish this all by by Wednesday. Otherwise, I think it'll be Thursday. And that, that, when I say finished by, like, Wednesday or Thursday, that's with me doing a full, probably, 10 to 12 hour paint day on him on each day. So, I think we can get it done for sure by Thursday, and then we can edit the video on Friday and upload it Saturday. That's my goal. So right in through here, I'm not going to really be able to get in there to chip it super well, so I'm actually just going to use my X-Acto blade and just kind of drag it along and see what chips off. I might actually cut a few spots and dig the knife in just to make it so it's not all flat and smooth. We can leave some of it smooth because we can always put texture paints on it and sand and all sorts of stuff. Okay, and once again, like we did with the other piece, I always like to make sure that there's no basing overhanging the edge of the base. And if there is, we cut it off, we chip it off, whatever we've got to do to get it out of the way.
Okay, so here's where we're at so far with the base. And we have a little over a half hour left before we call it quits for the night. So, yeah, that's what we're looking at. I think we're going to keep it pretty simple and just put down the, uh, the texture paints right now. And then from there, I think we'll do, uh, so we'll put the canvas, and I think the canvas on this thing for the tent is going to extend basically all the way up to the rock here, and then it's probably going to come out about this far, and on this side, probably about like that, and we'll have it so it ends. It won't come quite all the way up to the edge here. It'll be just like a torn piece of canvas. And then back here, I think we'll do another, like, pile of wood. Maybe we'll do some, uh, small stones as if there was a uh, fireplace or maybe we won't I don't know I haven't decided yet so let me grab my texture paints we've got two that I like to use I like rough gray pumice from Vallejo and then my other one gotta grab it real quick The other one I like to use is European Mud, also from Vallejo. These two tend to do a pretty good job. One gives you more of the muddy, roughed up earth, and the other is more of a sandy, gravelly, kind of just dirt texture. But before we can get on to that, we need to, uh, we got this little pile of debris here. Got to clean that up first. Because otherwise it's just going to become a, an obstacle that gets in the way. So what I'll do is I've got my, uh, my granola container that's full of corkboard. Because it kind of looks like granola and we'll just kind of scoop up the mess and throw it in there. the stuff that I can't manually grab and scoop up I'm just kind of wiping off the table into my hand and then we dump it in there perfect and I usually just throw the extra pieces of cork into the container unless they're too big to fit and those can get used later So for applying the texture paint, we're just going to use this little Sculpey tool. And we'll start with the stand without the uh, base plate in it. I think what we'll do, um, towards the front where the rocks are, there wouldn't be as many people walking in that area probably. So we'll use the rough gray pumice up there so that... It looks a little less disturbed, less wet, less gross. And then we'll use the European mud. And we'll put that towards the back half. Because it's reasonable to assume that if there's an army marching around and camping in the area, everywhere they're walking is going to be really muddy and gross. I just realized I totally unscrewed this uh, container, this little bottle here, right next to my microphone. So you guys probably got a little uh, unexpected ASMR there. <laughs> so we're just going to get a little bit on the spatula here, and we just uh, kind of start layering it on. And it looks like it's getting a little bit thick. I might need to throw a little bit of water in this when I store it after we're done here. Because I don't want it to dry out on me. I also use this same texturing stuff for a lot of my terrain that I make. 
I found that this is, I prefer this to just putting sand on terrain pieces. Like the sand gets the job done, but I find that this comes out looking a little more believable and natural, whereas the sand just ends up looking like sand. I like to uh, just take my finger and run it along the edge of the base and if there's any excess that is hanging over you wipe it off and then just throw it on a paper towel. In spots like this where you've got just a smidgen of the top of the base showing, you don't have to worry about those if you don't want to because once you paint it, the little bit of texturing that's on the base will look somewhat earthy and so it'll work out. I also like to do the same thing with the inner edge of the base to make sure that it's not overhanging inside and causing friction for the tray when we move it. Oh wait, nope, not putting that back there. We're putting mud back on that end. And you can kind of mix these two texture paints together a little bit. Uh, I wouldn't recommend like totally just mixing them together and applying the monstrosity that results, but like overlapping them a little bit on the, the base plate is fine. And then for the base plate, I usually like to just check and make sure that all the rocks are where I want them to be and that I know exactly where to have the texture end so the other one can begin. This can get a little bit difficult to apply when you've got tight cracks like we have along here. But I think we will still be able to make it work just fine. Um, basically we just have to kind of accept that some parts of the model are going to get some of this texture paste on them. And that's, a, that's fine because realistically 
you're wearing sandals like this guy is, and you're walking through muddy ground and dirt and stuff, shoes aren't staying clean. It's not going to happen. Just as long as you're not putting so much of the texture paste on the model that it starts ruining the details. So there's a point where it stops enhancing the model and starts ruining it. <laughs> There's not a ton I can do about removing that grinding noise for you, I'm afraid. I can. It's kind of just part of working with this particular texture paste because it's kind of a sandy, grainy texture. I am curious, though, I'll have to go back and watch the replay later and see just how much the mic picks it up. Because in theory, the microphone I have doesn't actually have the recording stuff on the back side. It's only a one-directional mic, so it's not supposed to be super sensitive to stuff that's happening behind the microphone. When you do this, don't try to get it super smooth. Like, don't go through and smooth it like that. It'll look a lot more believable if you're kind of letting it be roughed up a little bit. Especially if it's meant to represent an area that people are walking through and messing with. Lovely grinding. <laughs> okay, we're almost done with this particular texture, and then we'll go over to the mud. Mud's a little bit less grainy, so it might not be quite as obnoxious to listen to. And we may come back to this, we may go back and forth a little bit as we need. If I can get the lid back on, that'd be great. I guess I should wipe off my little scalpel spatula thing here. In this one we're gonna apply fairly generously. Like the more you put on, the more muddy it's gonna look and it's gonna look like there's been more traffic walking around on the mud. And this one's pretty quiet to put on. It doesn't have the little sand bits in it. Except for when I, like, actually, you know, scrape the metal piece against the plastic. I 
And some of this is going to get covered up when we put the, uh, the broken tent pieces on. Which I don't know if we're going to get to tonight, because I think by the time we get this texture paste on and get started on that stuff, it's going to be about time to call it a night. So if you guys want to find these texture paints, I get them on Amazon. I think uh, you have to kind of search around a little bit because some vendors on Amazon try to hike the price up and then others sell it at a pretty fair price. I think I was getting them for seven or eight dollars for a bottle this size. And this is the, uh, this is the 200 milliliter bottle of texture paints. But I've really come to enjoy these. They make life very simple and you can get, for the most part, you can just look at the name of the paste and know exactly what look you're gonna get. So the European mud, is, you know, it looks like mud. Uh, specifically mud with like bits of, you know, twigs and branches in it because occasionally you'll find actually like little bits of like moss in it that are designed to look like twigs when it dries or like, clump foliage that's accumulated in the mud or something. Okay, so we've got the stand done. Now we got to get his base. This is going to be cool when he's all done. Okay. Unfortunately, we won't, like, this stuff's not going to get fully dried before the end of our stream tonight. But the texture, like, the more they dry, the more the texture begins to show through. Especially on the pumice. The pumice, like, shrinks as it dries. And so by the time it's done, there might actually be spots where the base starts to show through a little bit. And you start to see the black showing through. But it comes down to having a texture of a very fine like dirt or sand kind of look and then this mud one I mean it, it stays looking like mud it it just shrinks a little bit and darkens and we're gonna be painting over this anyway so the color doesn't matter a ton although these are designed so that you could just get away with never painting over them like if this was the color of earth you wanted for your mud you just slap it on your model and call it done And in the case of these conquest bases, they have this little ridge here that goes around the base. I like to try and make sure I don't get any of the texture paste in there as well. That's just a personal preference. It doesn't hurt the model to have it in there. I just prefer to not have it down there. I like that to look clean. Okay. So at this point, we could be done with this base. Like, we don't have to do anything else to it if we don't want to. And I am going to do a, you know, a little bit more with it. But what will end up happening with the way we've done this is you've got this transition where 
on this side near the rocks people aren't walking around as much but then over here it's going to be more roughed up in fact we might even go through and just like spots where we want it to look like people have been walking we'll just start dabbing it so there's just more dents and recesses in it now what we don't want to do is create all these little like little sharp hairs that extend up we don't want those cuz mud usually doesn't look sharp unless it's like frozen Okay. We have about 10 minutes left in our stream tonight. Not uh, like 12 minutes, according to my clock here, but push those off to the back here. I don't know if it's worth it to start working on the tent pieces right now, just because. kind of an experiment process like it's not like I've done it enough where I can just throw it on and have it ready to go I'm probably gonna try multiple pieces and I've got to figure out where my Elmer's glue is run off to and water that down and apply it kind of like a paint almost so what I might do next is I might just magnetize the base and then we'll call it night Gotta go grab my magnets real quick. I mean, we're not uh, we're not quite done yet, but Zar Gifli, you have a good night. I'm assuming you've got work in early in the morning. Thank you for uh, watching. I'm sure we'll probably see you in the next few days when we play some conquest. But thank you for watching and have a good night. Then for the rest of you guys, just give me a second. I'm going to grab my magnets real quick. Because I think I took them into the other room to magnetize some base plates I was working on. Okay, luckily it didn't take very long to find them. Normally I try to keep all my hobby stuff here on my desk, but with the uh, convention I had last weekend, I was kind of working on my projects all over the place because I had terrain sitting on one table, models on another. So I like to use these uh, little two millimeter thick, or I guess they're three millimeter thick refrigerator magnets. I find if you go any th fatter than this, they tend to make it so that the bases don't stand flat. They don't sit flat. And then I also like to use these little metal discs that I, I think I got these ones on eBay or something like that. But with my monster bases, I have to make sure we've lined up the model exactly how we want it to stand. So I'm thinking that'll probably be the that's the front facing so this is our front edge of the base so we'll probably put a magnet basically right beneath these rocks and then two magnets back here monsters I do three magnets just because the surface area is greater and it just makes sense to do it that way So I just got three of these little discs, and these things are like super thin. And here's where we got to hope we have enough super glue to do our magnetizing. So all I'm going to do is a little circle towards the front. One back here, and one back here. 
and then all we do is we push the uh, little disc on now when you do this don't put the model back on the stand immediately because you'll end up gluing the base down and then you won't be able to remove it I mean you, you could it just it'll take a little bit of work and make sure when you do this you put these far enough in that the edges on the bottom of your base are going to be able to fit around it without you know getting offset by the the magnets and the metal discs and stuff Okay. so I'm going to start by putting this first magnet in place and then from there the other two should become a little bit easier to line up but we're just going to do it right under the rocks here so kind of hard to show with the size of this base so let's raise our camera just a little bit Um, yep, I'm going to actually tip this guy upside down and you're not going to be able to see this for a second because it's just the way it's going to work. So the dab of glue is right there. You can kind of see it reflecting. Helps if you actually open your magnets first, unlike me who just uh, decided to wait to do that. I'm just gonna take our magnet and stick it on and hope that we got it roughly in the right spot doesn't have to be exact you've got a little bit of leeway because the discs are bigger than the magnets yeah that's gonna work just fine so we can stick this on temporarily just to like make sure it's in the right spot but you don't want to let it sit there for too long because there is glue dripping off the magnet. And then we're going to do our second one, which if our first one lines up here, our second one's going to want to be basically right there. Ugh easier to do this when you've got your texture paints dry but it's okay luckily there's no details there that are important enough that we're destroying them or anything okay we might actually soak up some of the excess glue on this one so it doesn't stick to the stand when we put it back on to make sure this is lined up yeah that's holding it in place just nicely and then our third magnet goes basically just behind his sandal here. So we'll just kind of line that up. Um, is that right? It's actually going to go slightly in front of his sandal. That's better. Okay, and with that, he's magnetized. Um, we're not going to put him back on his stand, though, because we've got to let this glue dry. Otherwise, he'll get glued into his stand, and then we're going to be sad. So before we... Uh, we've got a few minutes left, just a few. But does anybody have any questions about this model before we call it a night? We've got time for one to two questions, depending on the nature of the question.
So I guess I can uh, do a little bit of a size comparison with uh, some of the other city-states stuff. Next to is uh, hoplites, which are still missing their shield arms because they're not quite done. We have our characters. And if anybody's wondering, this is how many extra pieces you end up with from the kit. Not sure that I have any use for those pieces. They'll just end up in a container until they, until I find a use for them. And there's your Minotaur next to them. I am very excited to get to paint these. The city-states are just a cool army all around. And, yeah... Good question. So, magnetizing the model. Um, if you go back through and rewatch while we were building it, what we had said, the. This arm, the mechanical arm or the stone arm, is going to be super easy to magnetize because this is a basically a ball and socket joint but there's no ball to go in the socket so both pieces are just a Let's see if I can find the piece on here for the mechanical arm where it connects um, I guess it would be the basically both of the arms have a flat connection point this one looks like it actually has a nub so this nub corresponds with a little nub that's inside the shoulder. And so if you chop that nub off now, it becomes a fully rotating arm. This one doesn't even have a nub, so it can rotate all the way around it. So you could easily put a magnet. In fact, this arm actually has a, a hole in it where you could actually put the magnet and it would work just fine. This arm, however, basically to make this pose, goes all the pieces go all the way up into here so this whole back is tied to the pose I do have a link to the little metal discs um, what I'll do is I will after this live stream is done I will go through and I'll put those links in the description I'll go edit them into the description so if you come back and click into the video maybe 10 minutes after the live stream has ended, those should be up there and you can look at the links. Um, but as I was saying with the, the back, so if you look here, this is the back for the other pose, the other arm, because the hammer arm is not extended up like this. It's sitting down at more of a ready stance. So you're going to have a bit of a hard time magnetizing the weapon arm. Now what you could do is you could glue them together. You could go right to the wrist and you could, you know, chop it with like a razor saw. And then you could do the same with the other arm and get the hands so it's just the hand with the weapon. But you would have to pick which arm pose you want. So you could have this arm and then just have the hammer so he's raising the hammer over his head like he's going to throw it. Or you could have both of them down at the ready stance. Although the spear, prob or not the spear, the trident probably wouldn't look good with the readied arm that's just standing at the ready. Get these back on there. Okay. So hopefully that answered your question. I, I kind of said earlier in the stream that kind of the same thing. Like it's honestly worth it to just buy a second giant. They're cool enough models that I wouldn't be offended owning two of them. I would be perfectly fine with that. And I don't think my wallet would mind too much, as long as I don't buy them both at the same time. Anyway, that's going to be it for our live stream tonight. Thank you guys so much for dropping in and watching. Um, our next live stream will probably be 
Friday of next week. So not this Friday, but the Friday after. Um, I don't know what we'll be working on. The Giant, this this guy will be long done. He's going to be done probably, probably by Wednesday or Thursday. Um, we'll figure something out, though. We'll find something to work on. I have plenty of Conquest models that we can paint on stream. I've got models for other games, too. Be watching for the tutorial on the Hephaestion. Uh, probably around Saturday. Assuming that life goes well. And we will talk to you guys later. Have a good night. And we'll catch you in the next one.